Good evening and welcome to this year's Christmas Eve watch night service. I do wish we could be together in the Kirk for this wonderful service. I look forward to it every single year, but we all know why we can't be together in person. But we can still gather together online as God's people for this time of worship together on this holiest of nights. And so we start our time together in this watch night service by singing together, Joy to the World. <coughs> Thank you. 
This evening's reading from Holy Scripture comes to us from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Hear now the word of God. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. This is God's word for us this evening, and to the Lord be the praise and the glory forever and ever. We continue now in worship by singing together our next watch night hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Once again, happy Christmas Eve, everyone. I know it almost certainly goes without saying, but this is not the kind of celebration that any of us had envisioned or hoped for. We all certainly know about the recent news of severe new restrictions, due in large part to the discovery of a new and more aggressive version 
of the coronavirus. This year, so many of us have had to drastically change or scale back our plans, and there is no denying that the necessity of doing so will come at a real cost to so very many of us. Nobody's life has been untouched by the continued reality of this pandemic. And as we continue to worship together online, as we await the coming of a new and hopefully much better year, it is only natural, I think, to look back on everything that has transpired in 2020. There are undoubtedly many ways that we could describe this year for our world. For me, if I had to look at the whole picture and then sum up this year in one word, I think I would pick the word disruption. Again, many other suitable words could be used to describe this year. But I choose the word disruption. Nearly every aspect of our lives has been disrupted, overturning many of the things that we all take for granted. And this includes worship. Because of the pandemic, those of us in Kemne have not been able to gather for Sunday worship since March 2020, and it isn't yet clear when this will change. Disruption continues to be all around us, and by its very nature, it is hardly ever pleasant to endure. Disruption can make us feel uprooted from the people, the places, and the things which usually give us comfort. And so you might be wondering, what does all this talk about disruption have to do with our service tonight? What does it have to do with our passage from Luke's gospel? Well, in my view, it has everything to do with it. From start to finish, the story of the nativity, this is a story of, maybe you guessed it, disruption. Consider the opening lines of this passage that I just read for us a few moments ago. It says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's what Luke tells us. It seems like simple, maybe factual information, but it is not. It is that, but it, perhaps it's much more. It tells us that Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the Roman Empire, issued a command to have a census of the whole empire of what he considered to be the known world. Why? Well, I think it's likely that he ordered this census so that he could determine how many people lived where, and of course, so that he could make sure that whoever lived wherever could pay their mandated amount of tax to the Roman Empire. That's pretty much why governments always take a census, to figure out population and taxation. So in other words, for Caesar Augustus, calling a census was really much a power play. In order to be properly counted, every person had to return to the place most associated with their lineage. For each of us, this might mean, for me, it would be returning back to the United States of America to be counted. For perhaps some of us around Scotland, it would be returning to the towns or places of our birth or other parts of the world as well. But for Joseph in our story... This meant traveling back to Bethlehem, a journey of, journey of about 90 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, for us in the modern world, 90 miles might sound very doable, especially on a motorway. We can make such a trip in the course of one rather long day. But this was hardly the case for people like Joseph and Mary. Such a journey would have undoubtedly happened in a large traveling caravan of people for safety reasons, and this would have been a mixture of relatives, friends, and travelers heading in the same direction, going together for the sake of convenience. Such a journey would have taken a very long time and would have passed through some dangerous terrain. In other words, it was not the kind of trip that one would probably make voluntarily or lightly. Not only did they have to make such an arduous trip, but we also know from the text that they had to do so while Mary was pregnant. And I think such a trip would have been hard enough without expecting a child. And once Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem, we all know what happened next. The text tells us and while they were there, the time came for Mary to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. 
So not only did they have to travel, not only was Mary pregnant while they traveled, she also had to give birth to her firstborn son in a strange place, in a manger, in a smelly barn. So I think in this story of the nativity, it counts as one massive disruption for Mary and Joseph. And zooming out for a second, because of what the angel had said to her before, Mary knew that she would somehow give birth to the Savior of the world. She trusted the Lord and that part of the plan. But we look back to what she was told on that, on that vision of the angel. She wasn't told a thing about all of these other disruptions. No warning was given about the census. No warning was given about not finding a place in Bethlehem. No warning was given about having to give birth in a manger, in a barn. Even though she did have some inside knowledge of God's saving plan, Mary herself still had to trust that God's plan would not be derailed by all the disruptions experienced by her and by Joseph. And the amazing thing is that amidst all this disruption, God's saving plan was still coming to fruition. Despite all of the mess, despite all of the uncertainty, all of the stress, the fact remains, Jesus was born. In fact, I think we can dare say that in the birth of Jesus, in these very unusual circumstances, in this time, God himself disrupted our disruptions. With the birth of Jesus, God has disrupted our world with his own disruptive grace. With the birth of Jesus, God has disrupted our hatred with love, our violence with peace, our sadness with joy, and our pain with healing. Now back in our own time, none of us know what is coming in 2021. We have hopes, we have dreams, we have some fears, some concerns. We don't know what is coming. But we do know that whatever comes our way, we can be sure that God will continue to mercifully disrupt our disruptions with the good news of Jesus Christ. Whatever comes our way in 2021, God assures us in Jesus that we will not make our journeys alone and that all things will ultimately be used for God's redemptive purposes. So as we lean into the wonder of Christmas, may we hold fast to this promise in our hearts and our minds. And may we do so in full trust in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we continue in worship. We continue to reflect on the wonder of our Lord's birth, this disrupting disruption, as we sing together our next Christmas Eve song, Still the Night. <coughs>
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, on this holy night we remember that you gave us your Son, the Lord of the universe, wrapped in swaddling cloths, the Savior of all, lying in a manger. On this holy night, draw us into the mystery of your love. Join our voices with the heavenly host, that we may sing your glory on high. Give us a place among the shepherds, that we too may find the one for whom we have waited. On this holy night, Lord, in which you have joined heaven and earth, we offer our prayers to the world and for those who are in need. On this night, we pray you will bestow your wisdom on all who govern, that they may honor the earth and its diverse races and cultures. We pray that you will grant reconciliation to those besought with conflict and with violence, that peace may begin to reign anew on this holy night. We pray for all who are cold, for all who are hungry or alone in this time. Embrace, O Lord, with your tender care all who wander alone or who have no place to lay their head, that they too, with us, may experience the hope offered in the birth of Jesus. We pray for all who are anxious, for all who are depressed, for all who are struggling with illness. Lord, draw near to those who find this season to be a source of pain or grief. Draw near to all who are suffering or sick, especially those we remember in the silence of our own minds and hearts. We pray that they may feel the comfort with us of this holy night. This night we pray for parents, families, and children. Strengthen all families of every kind in the bonds of love and commitment that our homes and our communities might be places of joy, and peace, and welcome for others. Finally, this night, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray that the blessing and wonder of Jesus' birth would fill our hearts anew. Open again on this night our hearts to your presence, that we may be transformed by the new birth of this holy night, that we all may truly become your body at work in this world, working for your cause of redemption and hope for all. We pray all these things in the name of the Savior, our friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. We now sing together our closing song of praise. Hark the herald angels sing.
Friends, may Jesus Christ, who is born this night, who draws together all things earthly and heavenly through his holy incarnation, may he fill us all with true joy and lasting peace in believing. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may this blessing fall upon each of us this Christmas time and forevermore. Jesus would be you, a baby.